All right, uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. I would like to welcome you all to this webinar. Um, just so you know, the webinar will be recorded and it will be available for guests uh, after uh, it is done. Um, again, my name is Charles Nyabeze and I'm the Vice President of Business Development and Commercialization with the Center for Excellence in Mining Innovation. And, and today we're hosting uh, the team from Lost Dutchman Mining and they'll be presenting, uh, actually this is their second presentation, and uh, this time around, they're going to be actually showcasing um, uh, a pilot plant uh, uh, with a capacity of up to 240 tons per day. And so that should be really interesting to, to hear about. Um, the way the presentation is going to go is uh, we will have about, have about 15 to 20 minutes of, of actual presentation time. And then following that is going to be some uh, questions and answers, which we're going to ask that you type into the chat box. And what I will do is uh, any question that is typed in, I'll be reading it out loud uh, for the benefit of everybody. And then uh, the team from Los Dutchmen will go ahead and answer that, uh, that question. Uh, what we'll also be doing is that after the presentation, we will be sending you a copy of these notes, the slide notes that you see up here, and also sending you a link so that you can be able to access the presentation on online as well to rewatch it if you wanna watch the video. And we're going to ask that you feel free to share the video with your with your peers and also share the slide notes with your peers as well. Uh, we will be notifying you on how to get engaged with Lost Dutchman uh, Mining after the presentation. So you will let that information as well. So it gives me great pleasure to um, introduce you to the Lost Dutchman team and Kenneth is going to uh, take it off from here. Uh, go ahead, Kenneth. Thank you, Charles. Uh, we appreciate this opportunity to showcase our process through CIMI. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Wayne Rod, Mark Ogram, and myself, Ken Abbott, and we're partners in Lost Dutchman Mining, uh, LDM. And we develop technology to separate particles, um, basically uh, separating by specific gravity one from another. Uh, we also have with us today, Dale Shea, I think, if Dale's made it in here, uh, from RIMCON LLC. He's a mining consultant who's become one of our team members with us for this process. Um, I don't know if he's, has he joined us yet, Charles, or not? I do see, I, I do see Dale online. He, he has joined us. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, our technology was developed actually quite a few years ago, and it's it's been in use successfully uh, since the mid nineties, uh, but not in mining. It's for other customers in other types of industrial uh, areas that have needs for separation. Uh, the use for mining was evident when we first developed this, this uh, technology, but in the industry at that time, um, there was no real interest for the process. Uh, there was not the pressure to conserve water, and um, there wasn't the, the environmental pressure that there is today for chemicals and so on. Uh, we get the, the partners of LDM still figure that, you know, still feel that this uh, that mining is the best use of our technology. So with that, I'll move a little forward. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if any of you were with us on the earlier, uh, the earlier webinar where we described our process and, and, um, and basically what it does. Uh, but we're kind of going to gloss over it again today for those of you who went, weren't with that. And then if you've got any questions at the end, we'll be happy to answer them. Uh, Wayne is, uh, Wayne Rod's going to discuss uh, some of the advantages of our process uh, to start off with. Uh, Wayne, you want to talk about this slide? Sure. Where is that slide? <laughs> oh, it's, it, it's on the, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, there we go. I'm sorry. I okay. advanced the wrong screen. <laughs> Well, we're getting good at this technology. Oh, so. yeah, we'll get um, it. The advantages we see, we believe our process has, you can see here on the uh, screen, the, this slide, the reduced operating cost as a result of significant reduction in water usage and chemical usage, usage and increased recoveries, same reason, reduced waste, uh, material handling reduction, we also think that there are some kind of softer advantages, one, of, one being decreasing the friction between mining companies and some of the other stakeholders, particularly over water issues around the world. And some of the friction that that has caused, we think will go away 
if a mining company can show that water usage is substantially uh, reduced. And obviously we think that by reducing the water usage, reducing the chemical usage, we increase environmental sustainability. Ken? Uh, thanks, Wayne. The, uh, the process that we have can be used in several sectors of the mining industry, but the, the ability to manage tailings and other waste material, as well as significantly reducing water requirements are the, the key components where we think our process is gonna be of some value. Uh, this, uh, this water use slide will be discussed by Wayne a little bit. He'll explain uh, why we feel that's a, a big deal. As I was looking at uh, mining issues in 2020, um, license to operate was one big one and water usage was also connected with that pretty significantly. We felt that if you can reduce water usage, let's just say by 50%, then we think that, that the mining operation is gonna be a lot more attractive to whatever country you're operating in. And we have situations where water usage has either slowed up or stopped mining production here and there. So if you can reduce it at least 50%, and then many of the mines are recycling the water they're currently used, say you reduce 50% and recycle that reduced rate by 60, 70%, we think you have a significant uh, uh, value proposition that you take to any stakeholders, whether you're already operating or whether you're in a uh, pre-permitting um, situation. Okay, Ken. So what we hope to illustrate briefly in this presentation is the basic operation of our process once again and how it can reduce the cost of doing business uh, in your industry. So <clears throat> the major benefits of our process for various types of minerals is shown on this slide. Uh, Dale, uh, Dale can explain this in a little bit more detail. Dale, uh, are you with us at this point? I think he's muted uh, there, Charles. Yes, I'm just checking. Oh, there we checking. go, cool. Okay, Dale. Oh, Dale's still muted, I think. Okay, let's ask him to talk. Hi, uh, Dale. Can you hear me now? Oh yeah, got you now, Dale. Oh, already, thank you. Um, we, we figure that, uh, you know, being able to set our system up at the, uh, at the crusher allows to do all kinds of ore sorting, you know, separating out uh, uh, the, of course, the ore from the, the waste product, uh, allows you to upgrade the ore, concentrate it, and uh, um, waste rejection is a big thing. Uh, you know, the, the more that of the waste that we can reject, that's the less, uh, amount of materials that have to go to the tailings impoundment. Um, types of ore concentration technologies, uh, you know, there's there's several out there that uh, like a Nelson concentrator and uh, those kinds of, uh, of instruments and, and, and technologies. But the LDM technology is really good because it's one of the few that can actually do both uh, free gold and refractory gold. Uh, it's a sensor-based technology, uh, meaning that process controls are, are what really make this, the system extremely efficient. Uh, next slide, please. On this slide, uh, we're trying to talk a little bit about sustainability, um, which is a huge issue in the mining companies nowadays. It's, it's huge to the companies themselves and to ESG investors and other types of, of stakeholders. Um, Four different ore, ore types, sulfide ores, oxide ores, and even uh, limestone type ores. The system allows a lot of sustainability benefits, uh, uh, including a reduction of, of haul truck loads. Uh, that's, a, that's a huge deal in operating costs, but it's also a huge deal for, uh, for uh, climate change goals. Uh, there's a reduction in greenhouse gases for those reasons. Uh, significantly less water usage, uh, is huge for an environmental and sustainability standpoint and an additional to uh, significantly less chemical usage. And what you end up reducing is uh, if, if you cut down uh, from say 10 truckloads to two truckloads going to your process facility, you can get away with fewer vats or flotation tanks 
if you're building a new infrastructure, or you can increase your throughput if you've already got, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, if you've already got the, the system built. Um, we've talked a lot about significantly less tails going to the impoundment. Uh, that's huge for tailings management. Now with the new uh, global initiatives on, uh, on tailings management, that's something that really needs to be considered. And of course, sending less tail to the impoundment also sends less water to the impoundment. And there's also beneficial waste rock usage, uh, particularly with, uh, with the limestone type ores. If you, can, uh, if you can remove that limestone waste, that material can be used for various remediation purposes, or the other waste can be used for uh, backfilling pits or building haul roads and so on. Um, one thing we really wanna, wanna press is uh, reprocessing, re <coughs> excuse me, reprocessing tailings is getting to be a big issue in the mining companies. Uh, whether they're selling the tails or doing it themselves, there's a significant revenue source. And if we can, if we can concentrate those tails, then that, that increased profits. Uh, back to you, Ken. Thanks, Dale. Uh, I think uh, this, this slide here will illustrate uh, the LDM process. And oops, I'm on the wrong one, I'm sorry. Uh, this di diagram is going to illustrate the current cost for ore processing and the steps that lead up to the final refining. The, uh, the LDM process is intended to reduce these costs by providing a way to reduce the amount of concentrate going to the final phases of processing. And this is, this is before refining. So basically where our cost cutting comes in is reducing the, the concentrate that goes into the final refining. Our process can do this without using chemicals or water, and we will significantly, significantly reduce the water needs of, and other various operating and environmental expenses along the way. Uh, the next slide here is the LDM process. And <clears throat> if you look at this diagram, we're showing the uh, potential in an optimum application. Um, of the operational cost reduction possible with the LDM process. I mean, we're showing an extreme example, uh, but several of our test results indicate this is indeed possible. And given optimum conditions, uh, you can achieve these kinds of cost reductions, particularly with regard to the fuel maintenance, environmental and equipment expense, all related to the transport of, of concentrate. This slide will make it a little easier to compare the two. Um, the, uh, the traditional approach up here compared to the LDM approach on the bottom and the impacts on um, the process on transportation costs, capital expense, fuel maintenance and labor costs. So Basically, the process uh, helps our, would help our clients change, uh, attain sustainability and, uh, and support the uh, reduction of the climate change impact. So as far as process scaling is concerned, we, we've had three different uh, process units that we've used in the course of our uh, development, the lab unit, and then we had a couple of pilot plant units. The, uh, the results that we got from those indicated that the results can, are, are very linear. <clears throat> we, uh, we established early on that uh, the, the, uh, the throughput of the material is depending on a couple of key items, all of which are controllable. And this slide indicates that uh, the highlighted one uh, is based on the one that we're going to show here in the next couple of slides, which is a mobile version of our technology. Our initial webinar basically um, zeroed in on the process itself and how it works and the major components. Uh, but we've had interest in what, how much we can do in a mobile unit. And we had worked on that. So that's what this webinar is for. The unit that you're going to see in the next few slides is based on ducting diameters of 48 inches. And with that, we can achieve a little over two tons an hour at a feed rate. Uh, if we increase this linearly, uh, as you go up in duct sizes, we can get for an individual unit uh, up to 
thousand tons uh, or pounds per hour feed rate, and you could achieve any feed rate you wanted by multiple units of the 48 inch diameter duct. The unit in this slide here is a two ton an hour unit. This is that 48 inch diameter highlighted unit. Um, you can either you could either uh, install several of these units multiplying the amount of two ton per hour units uh, you've got or you could go to some larger units. Uh, this would all be depending on what your goals were. This slide indicates a setup that would do, do uh, six tons per hour. So as you see, there's three two ton per hour units side by side. All of these uh, systems, or, or at least this size system, is something that we can make mobile in a series of um, basically customized shipping containers. Uh, there would be for a two, uh, for a six ton per hour unit, such as the one just shown, uh, there would be a total of nine shipping containers. And this shows the components that would be in each shipping container. So we would start with the ore feed from our, the customer over here and would come into our ore feed hopper. That is in one container. Uh, below it is another container which would include the hopper and structural uh, components required for the ore entrainment unit. That would, uh, that would introduce the ore into the DPS units that actually do the concentrating. And that is a total of three chambers stacked and then some ducting that would be shipped in this container over here in the end, this end container. And then the gang or dust uh, would be carried through here with all of the concentrate for this for the target um, for the target ore would be dropped out here. So the gang and dust goes up through this ducting into the dust collection unit and storage hopper for uh, for gang. The uh, fan up here would then just pull clean air <clears throat> out of the top of the dust collector, exhaust that into the atmosphere. Uh, the filtration efficiencies of our unit are such that the air coming out of here uh, is cleaner than the outside air. We, we have filtration of 99.9% uh, .9 down to a half a micron. So our air coming out of here is very, very clean. Uh, the bottom storage container here is for uh, all the miscellaneous ducting and everything that would be shipped. So there would be in this particular unit, six tons per, uh, six tons per hour, 120 tons per day. And that would involve nine shipping containers total, including one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine containers. This is the uh, actual process line. So this shows what's coming in in the previous diagram and the, the flow through the unit. This is a side view of a 12 ton per hour unit. And basically this is two ton per hour units just mirrored. So your ore delivery would be in this coming down the center. That ore would uh, be previously screened and a dry ore. We would auger it off of a belt or whatever delivery system was uh, available into the units. And then the concentrates would come out of the bottom here and out of the bottom over here. This is just a perspective view of that 12 ton per hour unit. And you can see the approximate size scale uh, indicated by the, the gentleman standing here. And um, these units are basically 10 foot wide individually, 10 foot high, and they're 50 feet long. And they are shippable by truck and they would be assembled on site. And we do, we have done this with our pieces of equipment using these identical containers. So we, uh, we are certain that can be achieved. This is a concentration chart that was done actually all with tailings from various sites. And uh, as, you know, as, as both Dale and Wayne mentioned, the tailings are, are becoming more and more important and potential sources for revenue. So these are some of the concentrations that we achieved uh, over the course of 19 various samples. Um, 
the these were all from abandoned mine sites. It, the, all the results were confirmed by assays conducted by Copper State Analytical Lab uh, located in Prescott, Arizona. At the time, they were one of the few certified labs in the state of Arizona, and that's why we used them. Uh, the chart uh, and the following chart show the, the target mineral concentrations in grams per ton before and after the concentration in our system. Um, in test eight, you'll see that we were able to concentrate 31 times. And that's about the average that we would see in concentrations. Uh, 20 to 40 in that range were pretty typical. We had some extremes. Uh, number 19 was a beauty, but you know it all depends on, on how much ore is in the sample. Uh, but as you'll see, the uh, the the 31-fold increase is uh, is pretty much of a pretty much an average, and this is for gold. The uh, uh, results we achieved with silver were very similar, um, and these were all from the same samples. We did have a pilot plant set up as well, and that was in uh, a mine in central New Mexico. We were up at a an 8,000 foot altitude. And it, it wasn't really an optimum site for us, but we, we intended to find out if we could mobilize our system. And this was the first attempt we had at taking it out of our lab and actually putting a larger one on site. And uh, this was a 24 inch diameter duct setup. And we, uh, we used that to see how things would work out and how easy it was to set this up on site and whether or not it could actually operate in a mobile environment without any infrastructure. So we located, we built everything into a trailer, um, we brought in a generator, supplied our own power. We have no water because we don't need it. Um, the unit for uh, uh, screening and drying we, we built over on the side, we auger it up into the loading hopper. We fed it into the trailer, into the, um, the DPS chamber separation device, which uh, continued, through the, continued through the trailer. I'm sorry, we didn't ship that over soon enough. Uh, so here was our screening device and drying device. Uh, we auger it up into our loading hopper. It went from there into the trailer and then went over that uh, was carried into the carried into and fed into the DPS units, which were right here. And then they went up into the dust collector and gain collection hoppers under here. From there, we conveyed it pneumatically back down inside the trailer into drums. Um, and all of this was taken from a tailings pile that was just to the left of that little backhoe there. So it wasn't an ideal setup. But we learned a lot from that, and we, we found out that, indeed, this can be a mobile system, and it, it works quite well as long as we can control uh, the screening and the dryness of the material. Um, those were the only major issues we ran up against. Other than that, it ran just, uh, just like it did in the lab. <clears throat> this 24-inch duct was also one of the data points we used as far as feed-through to confirm that we, our process is, in fact, linear. So we can estimate with some reasonable, um, with some reasonable confidence on the what the throughputs would be for any size unit that uh, might be required. Uh, Wayne, you want to discuss uh, what would come next uh, for anybody interested in talking to us about this? Sure. You want to switch over to that yep, slide? There you go. Sorry. There you go. <clears throat> through kind of through trial and error we've discovered a process that seems to work well for us as well as for our company. Mm -hmm. And the first step is we sign a non-disclosure agreement. And the reason for that is normally the company has some confidential information. They uh, wanna make sure it remains confidential. And we even had one situation where the company did not wanna disclose the uh, site location until an uh, NDA was signed. The second reason for the non-disclosure agreement is if a, at that point we can disclose to the company a uh, confidential report we have from a company called Cometco Research and Dale commissioned them and they did a, a third party evaluation of our technology and we think that might be helpful for companies uh, looking to work with us. Uh, the second step 
is a Zoom meeting with Mark Ogram and myself. And we've discovered that if we can do a Zoom meeting relatively early on, we can save a lot of time and effort on both of our parts. And we can focus in a little bit better on what the requirements might be um, better, a little bit better than we can through a lot of back and forth emails. And the third uh, step is after we understand the requirements, we'd draft a proposal uh, and send it to the mining company. And that'd be the basis for discussing a possible uh, uh, contract. We can basically do um, anything from the pilot plant to a full production unit, depending on what the requirements of the mining company are. We, uh, we have structured, uh, we can structure deals either as a, uh, a uh, non-exclusive license or an exclusive license or a sale of the technology. And that's the kind of stuff we just talk about uh, when we get somewhere down the line with the company. Uh, Ken, back to you. Uh, I think that's about all we have. Um, we can open this up for questions. I'll hand this back to Charles at this point and uh, I guess we'll open it for questions. Right, thank you very much, guys. We don't have a lot of time for questions, but we do have some key questions here that I want us to maybe address. Uh, so I have a question here from Adrian, and the question is, can you explain in more detail the steps of the LDM process? Also, what lab scale testing is done to evaluate possible ore and estimate gold recovery? Uh, well, let me go back to the step slide. Let me find that slide. There we go. Um, so to answer the first part of that question, Adrian, uh, the steps are um, taken from a, from a normal operation. Uh, the screening is typically done, uh, some screening is typically done before it would be going to, say, for instance, uh, a SAG or a ball mill. And <clears throat> we would do the, we, we still require screening also, uh, but it doesn't need to be reduced in size to, you know, the 200 mesh or whatever, you know, your, whatever you're feeding to your, to your sag or your ball. Um, what we would, re, ideally for us is we like to be somewhere in uh, 30 to 40 mesh range, it's ideal range for us. Anything from 20 to 60, we can do uh, very, uh, very nicely, uh, 30 to 40 being our sweet spot. So we would take uh, screen material from the customer if they've got a screener that is uh, capable of giving us 30 mesh material and finer, we would take it from them. Otherwise we would, we would include a, an additional part uh, not shown here uh, that would screen to the size we need um, with, a, you know, with a closed loop. So if it doesn't screen off, it goes back in and gets uh, crushed again and then comes back out. So out of the crusher, We'd get, uh, we'd get our screen material. It needs to be dry, reasonably dry. And, uh, and then it goes from that point, it feeds into our, uh, the loading hopper. And the loading hopper then introduces it to a feed mechanism that is part of our proprietary uh, information that then feeds it in, into this um, separation uh, chamber. And the separation takes place in there. Um, free gold is very easy to reduce. We, we could get above 90% efficiency uh, with free gold, uh, but we can also get very good efficiencies from refractory gold, depending on the ore amount and the amount of uh, you know, concentration of ore within the matrix. Uh, from there, it just goes over to the, essentially the dust collector and separation point where the gang is collected. Uh, refuse and which can go back to the tailings pile. Uh, did that answer that question? Okay, so I hope so. <laughs> All right, next question. Thank you, thank you, Ken. Uh, the next question is, uh, um, what will be the footprint for the forty um, ton per day unit? The the uh, how many tons per day? Uh, forty. The uh, oh, 40 tons per day. Yeah. Uh, I think the one I've got here is, uh, this is 12 tons. Uh, this is 240 tons a day. Okay. So those are two, 120, so 12 tons. So probably the footprint would be uh, half of this. I mean, 
if, if he wants to send that request to you, Charles, we could yep. actually send him a model of what that would look like with the dimensions sure. on it. Sure. sure. It would probably that. be the easiest. I'd rather do that than estimate this because it, that could be set up a couple of different ways. So I'd like to look at that and optimize it for the oh. smallest footprint. No problem. Thank you, Ken. Uh, another question here is, uh, what is the physical property that you're using to exploit to do the separation? Air. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because Dustin, I was going to guess it, but uh, I guess it is. Uh, there you go. All right. Uh, another question here is, uh, what is the feed particle size tested to this unit in microns? We, we tested everything um, from 20 mesh uh, to 100 mesh. All, okay. all the particles, various uh, mixes. Uh, we did most of the testing that we did that shows up in these charts yeah. uh, was uh, uh, these charts here. These were pretty much all in the 30 mesh range, 30 to 40 mesh was okay. what we were doing all these. And that's kind of a sweet spot. So that's why we chose that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because it was easy to optimize for our little lab unit we can do uh, get the same results with finer meshes. It just takes a higher degree of control and different and better screening methods than we had available for what we were doing. We've done it on small scales where we could hand screen uh, um, some test, test units. So we know, we know we can get the separation we need, but to do productions runs like we wanted for this for this pr um, presentation and for our actual uh, charts here and our, our assays, we needed to run a little bit more through. So we chose something that we could screen in, in, our, uh, in, our, in our screener. Our three, we have a three deck uh, screener for our lab units, about a 30 inch diameter. We now have a larger one, but we didn't have that at the time. So we zoomed in on the 30 to 40 uh, mesh okay. unit for most of this. Okay. So, Ken, we do have a couple more questions, but what we'll do is uh, we will put all these questions in a, in a document, and we will send that document around to all the participants. Uh, now, seeing that we are, we are at the top of the hour, it's 2 o'clock, and we have other meetings to go to as well, uh, okay. I'd like to just thank everybody for coming on the call, and uh, please check your inbox. Uh, we will be sending you answers to questions that we were not able to answer on the call and we will also provide you a copy of the recording. So on that note, thank you everybody for coming on the line and we appreciate you attending this call. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Thank, thank you, Charles. Charles. Thank you.